and welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have joined me for the first time today and you've stumbled across this channel because you like crime, well, I release it on a Wednesday and Sunday religiously. So, as I say, if you like crime and consistency, I am your girl. Big shout out to everybody who comes here. I really appreciate you. You know that I could not build this channel without you. Also, all of your comments, I read them and they make me feel really good. So thank you very much. If you do fancy giving me a like or subscribing because I want to get to 100,000 subs so I can get like a plaque or something to just prove to myself <laughs> that I have achieved something, then pop on notifications and subscribe and basically get involved. If you haven't joined me for a live chat before, it's fun. Do come and get involved because my crime community, Kenny's Crime Cult, is amazing. It's a really fun place to be and I tend to be there. So join me, join me. Also, Patreon, all of my subs there, thank you. I've got some exciting new things coming up on Patreon actually. So for those of you who are a part of it, thank you. But also you're going to be getting lots of opportunities to get other things that are exclusive to Patreon. Right, I'm going to get on with today's particularly gruesome case, I'm not going to lie. It's particularly gruesome today. It's one of those where I kept researching and thinking, this is depraved beyond belief, and I have covered a lot of serial killers. But nonetheless, Keith Hunter Jesperson takes the biscuit. He really does. I'm not saying that his body count was as high as many of our serial killers. It's just the way that he was so inhumane in general that really gets me in this case. All of our serial killers are sociopathic murderers, we all know that. But there is something about this guy that just doesn't have any human element. That's what I feel when I look at him. He doesn't really have a part of who he is that connects at any point with what we expect in a decent human being. Because, you know, serial killers, 95% of the time, might be able to actually have a life with people and essentially be somebody that's considered a friend. And even though we know the other 5% of the time they are absolute maniacs, the point is, you can almost reach in and say, OK, I understood why this individual was liked by his colleagues or his wife stayed with him. I am using the male term because, unfortunately, guys tend to kill people more. But you get what I'm saying. Keith Hunter Jesperson, yeah, he doesn't fit any of that. His paradigm of personality isn't one where you can reach in and be like, oh, he was just a good guy gone bad. It was just like through and through. If you cut him in half, I'm pretty sure it would just be so. So let's talk about him. He was born on the 6th of April 1955 in Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. He was the middle child. He had two older brothers, Bruce and Brad, and he had two younger sisters, Sharon and Jill. His parents were Leslie, known as Les, and Gladys Jesperson. Now his dad, by all accounts, was a really domineering alcoholic. He also had some pretty misogynistic views towards women, looked down on women in general. And there is undoubtedly an influence that he had over Jesperson's development. Remember, when you are being brought up in a family, your primary role models are your parents, if they're both present. And particularly for men, they're going to look at the father and how he treats people in this world. And to some degree, it can be influenced positively or negatively. So arguably, you may see your father treat people horribly and do the absolute opposite. Alternatively, you may take on some of the traits of that person. And in this case, it feels like Jesperson certainly identified with the more negative traits of his father. One of the things that his dad used to do was to put his kids down. Very sarcastic. And don't get me wrong, I'm incredibly sarcastic as a mother. I would say 97.3% of all interactions in my home is me taking the mick out of somebody. It's the way we communicate. It's just the way I am. But... I'm not humiliating them. I'm certainly not playing down their strengths. I'm not doing things that they could take away a feeling that I have meaning within the words that I say. But you can be very sarcastic, can't you, in life, and bring people down, tear them down. And even though you may get that superiority complex from that and feel good about the fact that you're able to do it, really, particularly with children, it's a massively unlevel playing field, isn't it? because they haven't developed the consciousness and conscience that they will do as adults. And so it's really easy to use those humiliating tactics towards children. And this is something that he did. Now, both father and grandfather 
were incredibly physically aggressive and they were aggressive to the children. So Jesperson was really subjected to harsh punishments if he stepped out of line even a tiny little bit. And one of the things that we see when we look at serial killers is some of those individuals have been brought up with incredibly disciplinarian experiences within their homes. Actually, it's more common than not. And particularly with disorganized serial killers, we do expect to see a very harsh disciplinarian in their life. And in this case, he had two. Now, when Jesperson was caught and sent to prison, his father completely denied that he'd ever been abusive. It's amazing how that happens, isn't it? It's like, um, he says I was abusive. Yeah, that didn't happen, ever. I was not abusive at all. Oh, it's just that everyone who knew you as a father said that you were definitely abusive. I was not abusive. It's like, people with eyes, they saw you, you were abusive. I wasn't abusive. So pathological liar is potential there. And like I said, on a genetics level, it's not looking good, is it? So family members literally said he definitely was abusive towards Jesperson. So we can acknowledge that he had a difficult childhood, a really difficult childhood. And one of the witnesses actually talked about the fact that he would be beaten with a belt until he couldn't scream anymore. So just put yourself in that position of being a child. I mean, the horror and terror of being violently abused is awful and speaks for itself. But to get to a point where you are so defeated, so helpless, so exhausted from the beating that you can't even scream, that demonstrates a really high level abusive situation. And it's terrible for any child to go through that. And when we think about forming children, so let's look at sociopathic formation. Certainly the world around you and the experiences that you have within it are forming. And for Jesperson, the forming and norming of violence is very clear in this instance. On one occasion, his father actually administered electric shocks on him. It was in a greenhouse that he did this. Now, his father claimed it was only 12 volts, but Jesperson claimed it was 220 volts. And the truth is, that doesn't matter. I don't care whether it was 12 volts, I don't care if it was two volts, I don't care if it was 220 volts. The very fact that his father is defending himself by clarifying the voltage says something deeply disturbing about this home. Because what is happening that a child is in a greenhouse being given electric shocks by a primary caregiver? And what kind of domineering, bullying behaviour is that? Because when you think about an experience with a parent, what you want is to feel that you are safe and protected and loved and valued. You are the person as a parent who is going to prevent your child experiencing pain, not ensure that they do. Now, from early childhood, Jesperson was frequently getting into trouble for very bad behaviour, but also very violent behaviour. And this is early on. One of the earliest memories that he recalled being violent was actually with his brother Brad at the park. Jesperson took a rock, rolled it down a slide, it hit Brad on the head, his head bled, and Brad obviously cried because of that. And even though you could say, well, this is the kind of thing that siblings do, it is. I can remember my brother having a few injuries because I had a penchant for designing what I believed was appropriate garden equipment, which turned out to be relatively dangerous equipment that was a lot of fun, but that did on occasion lead to my brother being catapulted <laughs> across the garden. And you would be amazed at how four-year-olds kind of bounce. But the point is, I'm not a psychopath. My brother and me are very close. I'm just saying, you do sometimes get injured as kids, certainly when I grew up, before health and safety went mad. I mean, our parks were literal death chambers. Anybody who went to a park in the 80s in the UK, there were basically instruments of torture and killing everywhere. And that's what we thought was fun. But it's also why we're resilient. We're also scarred. I have quite a few scars on my body from said place. But the point is, like I said, in childhood, that isn't necessarily going to lead to somebody becoming very violent, but it is indicative of his connection with not having an issue of causing people pain. And it seems to stay with him, this particular connection with violence. Now, his family moved from Canada to a trailer park in Seller, Washington. And at this point, Jesperson really didn't want to move. He didn't enjoy the experience of being relocated and it was something that he didn't want to happen. And that's challenging for a child. Look, 
Making peer relationships is difficult. It really is. This idea that children just walk into schools and connect with friends and it's all wonderful is just bollocks. It really is. Lots of children really struggle to connect with a good level of peer experience and once they have, to be taken from that is incredibly painful. So he obviously has some emotional cognition in that situation that he relates to the fact that he likes being in the space and place that he is. And potentially that's indicative of the fact that he struggled to create good relationships. So the idea of leaving them was going to be something challenging to him. It's without doubt, he had a really difficult childhood. Like I said, we have to look at the ingredients list of potential when we're exploring the forming of these individuals. And as far as childhood goes, he kind of ticks all the boxes for having a really tough time and for that time impacting on his psychology. Also, he was a really big guy for his age and that meant that he struggled to fit in. He stood out and he looked different. And of course, when we're forming relationships with people, what we know psychologically and from research scientifically is that we tend to go for people who very much reflect who we are. Even in relationships, we do that. So they've looked at symmetry in faces and the way that we relate to particular attractiveness. And often there is quite a similarity. And it's the same in friendship groups. We like what we reflect to some degree. So he struggles to make friends. He's often picked on by his siblings and other children. He experiences bullying. And one of the things that's very notable is that his parents even show him less attention than they show their siblings. Now, that is primarily devastating for a child. Anybody listening now, you know, we all appreciate, don't we, that in families there tends to be favourites. My brother will hold his hand up and admit that he is my mother's favourite, but it's not that she didn't have love for the rest of us. It's just that he happened to be miles easier. That's the truth. I'm just going to be honest. She preferred him because he wasn't a little bastard. Like, I don't know, me, for example. But the point is that even knowing that my mum preferred him when I was growing up, it certainly had an impact on me. That's something that's evened out as I got older and had a relationship with her in a different way. But you can remember that feeling of knowing that you weren't quite as popular. And that's in a home where I was very much loved. Imagine being in a home where there's lots of violence and you're treated really badly by your primary caregivers and they favour the other children to you. You're last on the list. Incredibly abandoning. And what we know psychologically is abandonment and attachment issues are big red flags for future. Now, on the most part, it leads to people actually being very vulnerable and very sensitive and very empathic and not wanting to lose relationships. But on the other side, it can create what I would consider a rageful intent where relationships are concerned. A sense that you never feel that the relationship is worth investing in because you feel a level of rage at how you've been abandoned in previous experiences. So you protect yourself on one level, but you also take it out on other people because you have this feeling that festered and became something very unmanageable. And I think for Jesperson, that's something we're looking at here. His brothers gave him the nickname Igor, or Ig for short. And that stuck with him all the way through school. And the classmates picked up on it and they started picking on him with it as well. But the idea of Igor, so we instantly are drawn, aren't we, to that kind of figure of being large and strong, but also an individual who's kind of strange. And certainly that's what they were trying to evidence in calling him this name. He became a really lonely child. He played on his own, spent a lot of time by himself. And it's acknowledged both by him and by people around him that his only friend was basically his Labrador retriever, Duke. Quite a lot of research gone into the idea that psychopaths do happen to favour dogs, particularly over humans. Yes, I know that they also kill animals, but what I'm saying is in relationships with psychopaths, because dogs are loyal, whatever, and accept you, whatever, that is both the beauty and grace and the sadness where dogs are concerned because they don't half end up in horrible homes sometimes and they shouldn't be loyal to their owners, but they still are. But nonetheless, it evidences the fact that for him, having that dog that was always with him and cared for him and loved him in spite of who he was, was something that had meaning to Jesperson, without a doubt. So he's got this very lonely experience and he also develops this really early fascination with fire. Think about fire, pyromania. 
when people have pyromania, that's one of the foundations that we expect to see in very high level psychopathy. In fact, think about David Berkowitz, son of Sam. He set fire to 1400 places in New York in a 14 month period. It's quite a lot of fires. He definitely takes one of the certificates for being the highest level pyromaniac we've heard of and is an individual who certainly played out the serial killing in the future. So this is something that is also in Jesperson's makeup. And also it seems like there was a history within the family because his grandfather also used to set fire to things, especially houses and wooded areas. So again, it's quite fascinating to see this DNA experience as well as the sociological and familial experience play out. Now, Jesperson fits in with our idea of what we expect to see early on in psychopathic serial killers. He enjoyed torturing and killing stray animals. And that was from the age of five. The age of five. Torturing and killing stray animals from the age of five. So let's just recap on what we're seeing at this point from a boy who is the age of five. So first of all, he's got violent tendencies. We've seen that in the way that he treats his brother. Secondly, he's killing animals. Thirdly, he's setting fire to things. Four, he's got very violent parents. Five, socially isolated. I mean, we are looking at the perfect foundations for creating a psychopath and a sociopathic killer without a doubt and if we consider the mcdonald triad which is a triad of traits that we expect to see in offenders like jesperson he certainly displays two out of the three traits because he sets fire to things pyromania and he tortures animals the only one that he doesn't display was bedwetting but again that may well have been there. This is a child who wasn't necessarily attended to as he should have been. So it could well be that he was bedwetting. And this is by the age of five. And just to put it in context with the animals that he harms, he doesn't just harm them by killing them himself. He also puts them in situations where they fight and kill each other. So he has this very clear attention to enjoying the demise of life. He actually had catched cats, dogs and birds near his trailer home. He dragged them into a field and he used to severely beat them with a shovel, but then he'd strangle them to death. Also worth noting, he used to enjoy caving gophers heads in, nailing crows to a board and throwing knives at them, nailing cats and small animals to a board and sticking nails and needles into them, tying two cats tails together with a wire and hanging them over a rope and then he'd watch as they attacked and scratched each other until one was dead. Every inch of my being right now wants to get a shovel and be with him in a room for 20 minutes. I'm joking, I'm just joking, I'm joking. I don't want to cave his head in with a shovel like he did the gophers. I'm just saying, as an individual who believes in animal rights and also doesn't eat them because of that, it really bothers me when somebody gets so much joy out of that kind of experience because I think every single one of you watching this you will just have that visceral and cerebral reaction to that kind of information. It's like so outside the realms of normal behavior. It's so indicative of great problematic psychological pathology without a doubt that you kind of feel a real response to it, which is if you can take innocent little creatures and also creatures that are already vulnerable because they might be strays and just put them in positions of great harm and death. It says something deeply sinister, doesn't it? And he later told a reporter, I was like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was like I was playing war. When I looked at those dogs, they would squat and pee. They'd be so scared that they'd tremble. So the power dynamic there is just clear. The domination that was something that really fed him. The fact that he enjoyed watching them wet themselves essentially because they were so terrified of him, that demonstrates a complete desire to have absolute authority and power over those victims. And they were victims, I mean, horrible deaths that they went through. And the fact that they knew it, 
that just demonstrates that he connected in a way with those feelings that very often we would be highly averse to, i.e. seeing an animal in pain, it's an aversion. We'd want to pull over our car if we saw an animal damaged on the side of the road and help it. That's the normal human response. It's the same with children. You don't have to have a child of your own to see a child in pain and not want to go and do something about it. That's what an altruistic human being does. And he's like got the opposite of that. He absolutely enjoys the terror that goes on in those animals' minds and eyes, so to speak. His father actually enjoyed that about him as well. So his dad sounds like a, sounds like a great role model, doesn't he? I mean, if he isn't electrocuting his son in a greenhouse, he's encouraging said son to go out and kill animals. And he's really proud about it. In fact, he used to watch his son. He'd encourage the animal abuse. Once, he watched his son throw a cat against a pavement and then strangle it. So he did that in front of his dad. And his father went out and bragged about it to people in the trailer park. Basically, he was saying to the people in the trailer park, look, my kid's really great because he's getting rid of all this stray cats and dogs. I mean, if I had been in the trailer park, Jesperson may well have found himself in a man trap, for example. Oh, did I leave, did I leave my man trap around? I wondered where that had gone. Oh, is your five-year-old son stuck in it? Well, hopefully the wounds will heal. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the way that most of us feel, isn't it? That when somebody does that stuff, you're like, there has to be some kind of response and reaction of consequence. But no, Jesperson's father absolutely encouraged his violent nature. It was something that he liked. And think about that as well. This is a child who we already know is struggling to relate to peers and even struggles within his own family. He's got a father who is very violent towards him and also who favours his siblings. And yet, in this area, his father shows a level of pride towards him. Now, that is a very alluring experience for a child, particularly one who feels that they're not noticed. And if you feel that somebody who ignores you most of the time, who abuses you most of the time, who makes you feel like a nobody most of the time and is sarcastic and humiliating and belittling towards you, then you are going to potentially try to amplify the areas where you get the positivity. And in this case, it's perverse, absolutely perverse. But that's a link that Jesperson can create between him and his father. When he's killing animals, his dad's proud. It's so broken and intrinsically disgusting. But think about it from the child's point of view. He's also a really awkward child, so he has very little social interaction with his peers. And people said that he was treated like an outcast by both his classmates and his own family. He didn't have a girlfriend during school. In fact, every single girl that he liked just rejected him and he didn't even go to his own prom. It's a big deal, isn't it, in the States, the prom? So the idea that he didn't go demonstrates that he really didn't feel a sense of belonging, because it's meant to be a rite of passage. He was teased all through school, and in gym class, people would particularly go for him because he couldn't reach the top of the rope climb. Now, if you're a bigger kid, it's going to be more problematic for you. And the last thing that you need are your peers bullying you because you can't attain that physically. Now, one day he actually managed to get to the top, but the rope came detached from the bracket and he fell 25 feet onto a hard surface. So he slammed the side of his head. Now that is important to note because what we understand from brain scans and violent behavior with poor impulse control, orbital cortex damage is something that can cause a very big problem. Now that was a serious, serious head injury right then. When he was nine, he actually called a woman bitch and her 16 year old son punched him to the ground and kicked him twice with pointed cowboy style boots as well. So that's another head injury. That in itself tells you that we've got some real potential here for damage. You will note by the way, whilst I'm telling this story that I have a dog wandering around, just keeping it real. You know that my dog is old and she just is very hard work at the moment because she's not so well. So she literally is with me all the time. And that means that my YouTube videos have an invader, an invader, Poppy, the problem dog. That's all I'm saying. So if you can hear lots of noise, it's her. It's nothing to do with me. It's fully to do with her. She's just sat down at my feet right now. But if you do hear some heavy breathing, it isn't me or Pete who's filming me. 
Now he did make friends. He made friends with a boy named Martin and the two would get into trouble together, basically. That was how their relationship was. It's really interesting, because I was writing an article yesterday about friendship and toxic friendship, and looking at the impact that that could have on the psychology of the individual experiencing it, you know, whether people should let toxic friendships go. And I was looking at research around negative connections. And what we see in negative friendship connections is it's so powerfully important to have connections in our lives that we would rather be with somebody who is incredibly negative than be alone. It's as simple as that, that desire for human connection. I mean, it's the same when you think about children. Ironically, children who are physically abused fare better psychologically to some degree than children who are fully neglected because there's still some kind of physical contact, which is bizarre and perverse, but real. It's kind of the same with friendships. So you get two double whammies really, which is one, you're hanging out with somebody really negative and that's something that's important to you because it's better than being alone. And that's problematic, of course, because you get into terrible behaviors. But two, it seems that you amplify the negative behaviors in both. So you essentially increase the negativity because both of you fire off one another. Now, Martin would often blame Jesperson for things that he'd done, and he'd get Jesperson in trouble, even though he was the one who'd carried it out. Now, that meant that Jesperson would be beaten by his dad, and that beating would tend to take place in front of everybody. So it was very humiliating for Jesperson, and also deeply unfair. It was his friend who was doing it. One day, Jesperson had had enough. So in revenge, he was around 10 years of age, he viciously attacked Martin. In fact, he knocked him unconscious. His dad had to drag him off that child. And Jesperson said later on, when he was interviewed about this, you know, as an adult, that his intention was to fully kill Martin. He didn't want to stop. As far as he was concerned, he was gonna to do to Martin what he did to animals, he was gonna kill him. There was another occasion as well, this is an early childhood, remember. He's swimming in the lake when another boy holds his head under the water until he blacks out, basically. So again, deeply disturbing attack and horrible to experience. But Jesperson decided that he'd had enough. He wasn't gonna take this kind of behavior anymore and he decided he was gonna stand up to the bully. So he got his revenge later. He saw that boy in a public swimming pool. He went over to him and he basically pushed his head under the water and he kept it there to such a point that the lifeguard had to intervene. He claimed he fully intended to drown that boy. So again, there's not the off switch, is there? There's just not that understanding of when enough is enough, he doesn't have it. Around 11 years of age, his father begins charging him and his siblings for room and board. Claimed it would teach them the value of money. Can we just think about that for a moment? 11 years of age. He was 11 years of age. 11. And his dad's like, you know what? You're a man now. You need to pay. Number one, where does a child get money from? I mean, who are these children? Who are these 11 year old children in the Western world going out and earning loads of money? But yeah, that's what he did. Now, if it's not bad enough that Jesperson had to find $30 a week to pay for his room and board, he found out later on that he'd been made to pay more than his siblings and for far longer. I mean, is that just me? Is it just me? What a horrible parent. Could you imagine your 11 year old kid, you know, just about to high school age, just walking in and you're like, right son, sit down. We need to talk about the value of money. Don't know how it's gonna work, but you need to find $120 a month to give me, or I'm afraid it's a, uh, see ya. <laughs> Dad, I don't even know how to do algebra. I, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do for that. Oh, it's not my problem. It's not, son, it's not my problem. This is real world. This is how it is. You're 11 now, deal with it. I don't know, just get a job. No one will employ me, not my problem. Do you know what I mean? This kid has got a lot of things happening to him that we have to acknowledge are really unspeakable, aren't they? You know, as much as what I'm gonna highlight in these crimes is diabolical and he deserves everything that he gets, the point is, this is not how any child should be treated. You know, this is a way of forming a deviant. It's a way of forming a rageful human. It's a way of forming somebody with great potential for harm. Or 
it's a way of ruining them fully so that they're so vulnerable and unable to connect with other human beings that their life's going to be a disaster anyway. And that's thanks to his parents. It's as simple as that. His mother as well, because she would have been present when all this was happening. So around this time, Jesperson also claims he's a victim of sexual assault. He and a few of his school friends, they are made to strip naked by a local dairyman. The dairyman then also strips naked and basically tells him to touch his genitals. Now, Jesperson runs away, which shows that he has some good sense, but that's a horribly traumatic experience. And one imagines that, in essence, that sexual molestation that essentially occurred in that moment would have stark impact on the way that he relates to sex and sexual experience in the future. Not for one minute am I saying that people who are abused want to go and abuse people. I'm saying that when you are traumatized sexually, it can have horrible ramifications on the way that you treat yourself, but also at times the way that you treat sex per se, because it can become quite a scary thing for you. And again, if you want to take power back, it has the potential as well to, in certain rare humans, skew the identity that they have with sex and with the power balance within that. So if I felt very powerless and helpless, and I don't want to feel that anymore, well, I might become more domineering because in essence, that will protect me. Like I said, that's very rare. In sexual abused victims, it tends to be quite the contrary, but nonetheless, we have to highlight that this is a possibility with him. Also, we see an escalation in problems for Jesperson after his father gives him a BB gun. Dad's like, you know, Son, massively violent tendencies, has the odd occasion of trying to kill friends. What I should do is I should arm him. I should arm him. Here, son, have a gun. I don't know. For his 18th, it might have been an AK-47 in this day and age. But nonetheless, hands his son a BB gun. And what does that son do? He goes and shoots one of his neighbours in the genitals. That's number one. Then he shoots a neighbour in her backside as she bends over. And of course, he carries on his horrible behaviour towards animals, but he's now able to shoot them. If there was a parenting handbook that told you how to do everything wrong, I think that Jesperson's dad probably wrote it. I think he probably self-published how to screw up parenting. So now he's starting to get into lots of trouble and he even starts shoplifting with a friend, again, another negative friend. And around this time, he even shoots an arrow with an exploding tip at a teacher's house, which I think we can all agree is not the most effective way to enamour teachers at any point. Shooting arrows at their homes with exploding tips. What the hell is an arrow with an exploding tip anyway? That sounds very, very dangerous. I imagine getting hit with one of those isn't going to be good. So he's also experimenting with things like pipe bombs. I did say that. Jesperson has graduated and now he's experimenting with pipe bombs. So if we think about everything that he's been doing up until this point, we are at a point where we realise that alarm bells should have been ringing. It's as simple as that. I mean, when we're looking at pipe bombs, we're thinking terrorism, aren't we? We're thinking potential mass killing. And this is at a really early age. His brain seems to coordinate itself with anything negative and harmful. Now, a classmate of Jesperson would later describe him as this. He said he could be bright when he wanted to, but then he'd do something stupid. He'd be too kind or too mean or too generous or too stingy. You never saw the in-between. I always wondered if he was in control of his own brain, if he might have had brain damage because he sure acted like it. So that's somebody who knew him, genuinely felt that there was something that didn't quite connect. And actually, when we look at psychopathic brains, we can see that in certain areas, there are poor connectivity issues. The prefrontal ventromedial cortex and the amygdala, if they aren't interacting correctly, what we'll often see is lower impulse control and higher propensity for violence. And also a higher reaction when they consider they're in a situation of potential harm. So again, highly violent reactions when defending themselves. So this could be something that was going on in his mind and brain. And we also know that he's had serious head injuries, which again is going to exacerbate these potential problems. He claims he lost his virginity at 14, but he also then went on to talk about the fact that as far as he was concerned, it was rape. 
Now, I can't confirm or deny that, but it's what he relates to his first sexual encounter was not consensual. When he was 16, his father did something that I just find beyond reprehensible for a whole raft of reasons. But his dad shot Duke, his Labrador. That had been his lifelong friend, his lifelong companion. Now, his father said the reason that he did it was because the dog looked in a bad way and he felt that the dog might have eaten poison. But I think that was just an excuse. I think if you really want to hurt somebody badly, you look at decimating things of meaning to them. For Jesperson, he already felt abandoned, alone, rejected. He already struggled with social relationships and the one constant that he'd had in his life was his dog, Duke. And he had that taken away from him by his father. And again, let's look at that link, the fact that his father is quite happy to kill an animal, an animal of great meaning. So to some context, we're seeing that link again in behavior, like father, like son. But I have a real empathy and sympathy at this moment in time when I think about how that child would have felt at 16 years of age. You know, my dog is in here right now. She's in a bad way to some degree. If somebody came in to shoot her, it would not end well for them. It also would mean that they go to prison as what are they doing in my home with a gun shooting my dog. I'm stroking her at this moment in time. Now, he graduates high school in 1973, but he didn't attend college. And the reason for that was because his father basically said that he wasn't capable, so he couldn't do it. And he didn't do great at school in spite of the fact that he had an average IQ because he only ranked 161st out of 174 in his class. So in spite of the fact that he could have succeeded, he didn't. He did have a relationship after school though. He actually married Rose Hook in 1975. Now he was 20 at that point. And they went on to have three children, two daughters and a son. Jesperson at this point supported his family financially by working as a truck driver. So obviously he's holding down a job, he's in a relationship and he's not as alone as he was before. And really at this point we would hope that he would have triumph over adversity because obviously he's achieved things that might not have been too obvious to him earlier on in his life. However, his eldest child, Melissa, remembers from a really early age that there were some concerning behaviours. And I think it's awful that she actually even has these memories. She remembers her dad killing stray cats and gophers that just wandered onto the land from the apple orchard alongside the property. Now, on one occasion, she found little kittens in the basement of the house. So she takes them outside to play with them. And Jesperson takes each one of them and hangs them on a clothesline. And then he was laughing at their attempts to claw each other to escape. Can you imagine what that is for a child to witness? Your own father taking these defenseless animals and hanging them on a clothesline and then just finding it fun. She was absolutely terrified. She was horrified. She ran to her mother and when they both return there, the kittens were all dead on the ground. So it's almost like he has no understanding of the impact of those actions. He has so little empathy running through his veins that he can't understand that his daughter, who has empathy, is going to be highly traumatised by this. Now that marriage between Jesperson and his wife, it lasted 14 years. So again, for those years, he managed to maintain a semblance of normal family life, albeit with these odd behaviours. But it ends because he starts getting phone calls from mystery women. And Rose basically thinks that he's had an affair. So this then ends the relationship. And when Melissa is 10 years of age, her mum actually moves the family 200 miles away to her parents' house in Spokane, Washington. And that's whilst Jesperson is out on the road. That's quite telling, isn't it? When somebody leaves somebody without telling them that they're going, there's usually a fear about the reaction of that person. You know, most of us, when we're leaving a relationship, it's really awkward and no one wants to go through it. But you kind of have to say it. You're kind of like, I'm going to leave you and I'm taking half of the stuff with me. And it's awkward and difficult and sad, but that's how you manage it. When somebody goes, does a midnight flick, when the person that they're meant to be with isn't around, it tends to be because they have an understanding that if they do tell that person, they may be prevented from leaving or they may be harmed because they're leaving. And I'm assuming that, I've not got an absolute reality to it, but it would certainly fit with what I've seen in relationships. Now, Jesperson does continue to see his family. Whenever he's in the area with his truck driving, he goes and visits. Melissa, 
actually recalls an occasion that he picked them up in a truck. When they're in the truck, they find cigarettes in the glove compartment and Jesperson doesn't smoke. So they ask him about why the cigarettes in there and he says basically it's for women that he picked up. So he's just, no boundaries. Dad, who's in these cigarettes? Oh, they're just random women that I pick up who smoke them. Okay, seems really not well adjusted at all. They also find duct tape. That's right. They find cigarettes of women, anonymous women, and duct tape. Is it just me? But if I was anywhere that didn't involve plumbing and duct tape was found, okay, maybe electrics as well. These things are used. But if I was just in a random place, like in a car with somebody and they had duct tape, I would immediately think, I'm getting out of the car, I'm going to get murdered. Duct tape is not something that he should have in his vehicle. But Melissa would later tell reporters that there was another side to her father as well that made her feel really deeply uncomfortable because he had, again, a real problem with these boundaries and he would explicitly talk to her about the sex that he'd had with her mother. I mean, that is not something that children want to hear about ever. Let's be honest, most of our kids want to believe that we had sex on the occasion that they were conceived and never again. That's what kids want to believe about their parents. The idea of us having sex at all for pleasure is something that's terrifying for them and should be an avoided conversation because it makes them deeply uneasy. But he just talks about this and that's awful. Also, when she was with him, he'd leer at women in public, he'd make lewd comments and he'd even harass them in front of her. And once he told her, you know, I have something to tell you and it's really important. And there was a long silence. He then continued, I can't tell you, sweetie. If I tell you, you'll tell the police. I'm not what you think I am, Melissa. Again, very poor boundaries. But secondly, the fact that he engages in that conversation with his daughter is just horrifying because even as a child, you would know well, if my dad is suggesting that he's doing something really bad, that if the police get involved, he's going to be in serious trouble, you're automatically, as a child, thinking, Jesus, what kind of a felon am I with at this moment in time? What is he talking about? What about the cigarettes and duct tape? You know, these are really big problems for a child to carry. They're burdens, and he's happy to give his children burdens. Jesperson and Rose get divorced in 1990, and it seems that from 1990 onwards, this actually marks the beginning of a bloody rampage. It's also worth us acknowledging that we know from research that what happens with serial killers is during periods of stress, it tends to amplify their behaviour. So the fact that he got divorced and it seems like the killings begin after the divorce, it could well be that he was dealing with those feelings of abandonment, attachment issues are all surfacing, but also he's stressed. Anybody getting divorced knows it's stressful. So the first killing, at least the first official victim. And I always say that because I think with serial killers, one, they're pathological liars. Secondly, often they won't tell you the truth about all of their victims. They like to keep some power dynamic going on there that they know more than you. And most importantly, we only have the evidence from the killings that the police were aware of per se, but it doesn't mean that there weren't more. So the first killing is Tanya Bennett. She's 23 years old. She was described by people who knew her as cheerful, a really lovely person. She was very outgoing. And one of the things that was very common for her was that she would get involved striking up conversations with strangers. So she was a very, very affable, agreeable person. Tanya also had a learning difficulty. That meant she was incredibly trusting of people and very, very naive. Now, Jesperson found this very sexually appealing, remember? This is a man who likes dominating. So if you're somebody who has certain needs and you're vulnerable, then that person is gonna be more likely to meet predators who want to exploit them. And unfortunately for Tanya, that's exactly what happens. She's trusting of him. She's gone to a bar called the B&I Tavern. It's near Portland, Oregon. It's 21st of January, 1990. She plans to meet her friends there and she's seen there drinking a mix of beer and wine and she's very visibly intoxicated. 
Obviously, she's completely unaware that 35-year-old Jesperson's been watching her all night. He then approaches her in this very inebriated and vulnerable state, and he offers to buy her a drink. Later, he says, look, let's go get some dinner. But he creates this ruse and says, I don't have enough cash to actually buy it, so do you want to come home with me? I'll get more money and we can go out. And she's like, great. She enjoys talking to strangers. This guy seems genuinely interested in her and now he wants to take her out for some food. Obviously, we know that this is just a plan to get her alone. So he takes Tanya back to his house that he's renting. She willingly goes in with him and he even coaxes her into having sex, which she goes ahead and does. But then it's like his anger towards women really surfaces. Because after they've had sex, he starts making some real cruel remarks to her, a bit like his father did to him. So he starts humiliating her, belittling her, being nasty about the way that she looks. They get into an argument, and at this point, Jesperson hits her. And she tries fighting back. She tries defending herself. And in response to that, in response to her trying to defend herself, he brutally beats her. He puts her in the head 20 times, and her face was so swollen that she was completely unrecognisable, literally completely unrecognisable. One of the punches actually meant that her teeth punctured her lower lip, and then he held her neck with one hand and he put a rope around it with the other, and he pulled it until she was dead. So it's a really gruesome and brutal killing. Then he realises, look, I need to make sure that people don't associate me with this person. I need to get an alibi. So he goes back for drinks at b and Tavern, and he also starts chatting to random people because he wanted to create this alibi for him. So he's really thinking about that. But again, just put yourself in that position. You've just brutally murdered somebody, horrifically beat them to an unrecognisable pulp. You're not even panicking. He's not worried about his actions. There's no fear. There's no, oh my God, I've just been possessed by something. What the hell have I done? It's essentially a job done, right, let's create an alibi. And the fact that he could just get on with his evening shows some deeply disturbing traits. Later on, obviously, he's got a body that he needs to dispose of. So he takes Tanya's body and belongings, puts them in a friend's car, drives them towards the Columbia River Gorge, basically pulls off the highway, throws a body over an embankment like a piece of rubbish. Later, he throws her walkman out of the window and then he drives to a truck stop near Troutdale, where he spends the rest of the evening drinking coffee and talking. Again, he's establishing an alibi, so he's very, very calculating. Now, in the morning, he then disposes of Tonya's purse along the Sandy River Highway. So, arguably, he's trying to make it difficult to link him and also to link who she is by disposing these things in different places. The next day, he just acts like nothing has happened. He's back on the road in his truck. There's no conscience there. Tonya's reported missing later that day, and they actually find her half-dressed body two days later. It seems that her parents had last seen her alive about a week before. Her body was spotted by a student from Mount Hood Community College, um, basically bicycling along the old scenic highway north of Portland, and came across her body. Rope was still tied around her neck. Bra was pulled up to expose her breasts. Her underwear had been pulled down around her ankles and also the zipper section of her jeans had been cut off and taken and they believe that was possibly as a trophy. However, the police have got absolutely no suspects and no leads. It's also worth acknowledging that Jesperson had a particular penchant for wanting to draw his kills out. Remember, he'd been experimenting with strangling animals since a child. And I'll quote what he says. You come to a point where killing something is nothing. You've already felt the pressure on the throat of them trying to grab air. You're actually squeezing the life out of these animals and there isn't much difference. They're gonna fight for their lives just as much as a human being will. So he would strangle his victims until they lost consciousness, then he'd revive them and then he'd strangle them again, which is really similar to Dennis Rader, BTK. He would also do that. And also he'd be later quoted as saying, it was their fate to die in my hands, like a car accident or illness. So this way of almost pre-setting fate, that this was always going to happen. Think about the way he's legitimising what he's doing there. 
So he sees himself as a killer, but he also sees these individuals as victims who are meant to die. And it almost steps aside the conscious reality of his responsibility, doesn't it? Well, this is just the way it's meant to be. That's his mindset. Bizarrely, Jesperson wouldn't even be suspected of Tonya's death for many, many years. In fact, and this is unbelievable to talk about because when you're like, what? How did this ever happen? The reason that he didn't get into trouble for her death was the attention was detracted away from him following the confession from 57-year-old Laverne Pavlinak. She claims that her long-term living boyfriend, that's 43-year-old John Sosnovsky, has confessed to killing Tonya whilst drunk. Go with me on this. So she then changes her story and says that basically he'd forced her to help him rape and murder Tonya and then help him dispose of her body. So on the 5th of March 1990, they both get arrested and charged with Tonya's murder, which is unbelievable because bear in mind, this is a story that has just been completely concocted. I mean, what the hell she's thinking about saying that she's been involved in the rape and murder of a woman? I've got no idea. How she thought this was going to end well for anybody involved is shocking to me. Now, Sosnovsky refuses to plead guilty. And of course, at the beginning, you're going you're gonna to be like, sorry, I don't know any about this. this. This is not something I'm involved in. I've never met this woman. But eventually, please no contest to the charge because he's up for the death penalty. So on the 8th of February, 1991, both are found guilty. Sosnovsky gets life in prison. Pavlinak gets a minimum of 10 years. Now, she was expecting a much shorter sentence than that. The reality of this story is that she's made it all up, obviously. She's apparently got this real habit of calling the police and falsely accusing her boyfriend of being an abuser. In fact, whenever they had an argument, she would basically accuse him of crimes. So they knew that she had this history. Also, she's a fan of the TV series Matlock and true crime books. She knew the police procedure. So what she tried to do was to create this really believable scenario. And the reason for it, she wanted to end the relationship with the boyfriend and get him out of the house. That's right. <laughs> to end the relationship and to remove him from her home, she thought, I'll accuse him of murdering and raping somebody and making me a co-conspirator to the crime. This will end perfectly. That's what she did. So she contacted the detectives in charge of the investigation, but the facts of the crime that she gave them in the false confession had actually been taken from the reports about the murder in the media. So she gave a detailed account of Sosnovsky's rape and strangulation of Tonya. She went so far as to plant a purse containing buttons from jeans in his car, although apparently the purse immediately was established not to belong to Tonya and denim didn't match the jeans that she was wearing, so it was clear they weren't them. The police then interview her multiple times over the next few weeks. She was even able to honestly point out where the body had been found, so within about 10 feet, probably just guesswork, but the point was she did manage to do that. So even though the police had doubts, they obviously chased up the leads and investigated what she'd said. And they go around and they speak to people at bars where Tanya drank. And it's really unfortunate for Sosnovsky because he was a well-known drinker. So police went and spoke to a waitress who'd been at the bar that he'd been in. And bizarrely, he'd bragged about murdering a woman that he'd met in a bar and he'd actually laughed about it. Now, when he was questioned, he denied any involvement at all in Tonya's death. He took a lie detector test, however, and he failed spectacularly. I mean, this guy, talk about a line of horrific mishaps. One, his girlfriend is fitting him up for murder. Two, He's made up a story about murdering a woman. Three, when he gets put on a polygraph, he fails it. Now, why did he fail it? Well, it seems that in truth, he drank so often that he had blackouts. So he literally could not remember episodes of his life. And because of that, he wasn't entirely sure he hadn't been involved. So even he, because of these mass blackouts, this high level alcoholic behavior, meant that he didn't trust himself which is why he failed. 
Now, during the search of Pavlinak and Sosnovsky's home, police actually find an envelope addressed to Sosnovsky with T. Bennett, a good piece written on the back. Sosnovsky always denied writing the note and he always denied killing Tonya. But in spite of this kind of circumstantial evidence with respect, you know, there's no forensics, etc. Now, there were holes in the prosecution case against him because Tonya had been seen in a bar on the night that she disappeared, which was 25 miles away from where Pavlinak had claimed Sosnovsky had met her. So she'd been playing pool with two men. Neither of the men matched the description of Sosnovsky. But the jury still found them both guilty. And the fact that Sosnovsky got sentenced to life with a minimum term of 15 years demonstrates how guilty they believed he was. Now, after the conviction, of course, Pavlinak's like, um, hang on, uh, this, uh, this story that I've made up, you know, about my partner brutally raping and killing and dumping the body of this poor girl with me. Yeah, I, I, it was, I, was, I was just trying to end the relationship. And now, on reflection, I do think it was probably a bit of a dramatic, it's probably, it's probably a bit of an exaggerated requirement to have gone this far. Can we forget about it? Can we, can we just forget about it? He's like, no, you can't. You're in prison now. So she then starts telling authorities the truth. She says that she made it all up. And um, they were like, right, yeah, right. Which bit? Like the confession, all the things that you circumstantially, when we pieced together, seemed like you definitely did it. The fact that you pointed out where her body was. And literally, they discredit her. They remained incarcerated. And that meant that Jesperson was free to rack up a body count. And he said to reporters later on, that when those two individuals were sentenced for his crime, he felt like he'd been handed a license to continue to kill. He was so annoyed that other people had taken responsibility for the killing that he started to try to take responsibility for it in a more anonymous way. He saw it as his right to be known as the killer of Tanya because he was annoyed for not being credited for the kill, because of all of this attention on Pavlinak and her boyfriend, he starts doing things like writing a confession. So he writes a confession on the wall of toilets at the Greyhound bus depot in Livingston, Montana. That's hundreds of miles away from where the killing had occurred. And it read, I killed Tonya Bennett, January 21st, 1990, in Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her and loved it. I know I'm sick, but I enjoy myself too. Two people took the blame and I'm free. So he really wants people to know. He also referred to the buttons that he cut off her jeans and signed the letter off with a smiley face, a circle with two dots for eyes and a crescent smile. Now that was of absolutely no use to the police because anyone could have written it. Now, a few days later in a truck stop toilet in Umatilla, Oregon, there's a second message found and it reads, I killed Tanya Bennett in Portland. Two people got the blame so I can kill again. Again, he signs it off with a smiley face. However, this one, it doesn't even attract any publicity. So therefore he tries another approach. So Jesperson writes to the police departments and media outlets claiming responsibility. Again, he signs letters off with a smiley face. He sent a six-side letter to the Oregonian newspaper. And this is where Phil Stanford, who was a journalist who was working on the story, coined the name the Happy Face Killer due to his unique signature. Now, the next known attack of Jesperson is on the 12th of April, 1990. It's a Thursday night. Dawn Slagle just got into an argument with her husband and basically she fled the house with her infant son and she ends up in a shopping center in Mount Shasta, California. Now she's sat in a parking lot because she needs to cool off and at this point she notices a man, he's in a 1974 Chevy Nova and he's looking in her direction and that's Jesperson. So he approaches her, introduces himself, gives lots of personal information about who he is, what he does, and basically makes her feel completely comfortable with him. Start chatting with each other and he offers them a lift. He says he's a family man, he's missing his kids since separating from his wife, and she said he did not appear threatening. It's a good backstory that, isn't it? Because you really can disarm someone with talks about the family. 
If you are suggesting that you love children and your ex-wife and you've gone through these difficult experiences, it's making the person feel an empathy for you. But also when you're a dad, a lot of people assume that you're a good loving person. And even though it's a myth in certain circumstances, it's how a woman will often be lured into these scenarios because how threatening can he be when he's talking about his ex-wife and kids and how difficult it's been. So Dawn feels uneasy, but she does agree to go with him. Now, her fears are realized when he starts driving to a remote location. He then stops the car and apparently she said his face went blank. And for the next couple of hours, he constantly tries to sexually assault her. That goes on several times. She resists and every time he basically tries to break her neck multiple times. Her child is screaming during the struggles and at one point the child falls onto the floor and then rolls onto the brake pedal and Jesperson tries to crush his skull. Can you imagine how terrifying this is for this woman, this mother? Now ultimately he just suddenly stops and it could be because there was the presence of the child but there is something that breaks the fantasy that's going on for him. He then drives them back to the shopping centre in silence. Before letting her out of the car, he says to her, never get in a car with a stranger because you never know if it's the last thing you'll ever do. He also tells her not to tell anyone what's happened. Obviously, she's like, okay, I won't tell anyone that you've just hideously tried to rape and murder me. No, that didn't happen. She immediately went to the police. Of course she did. And basically, the police get to him and he's arrested at gunpoint. Also, she's the only known survivor of one of Jesperson's attacks. He claims that he didn't try to break her neck. It had just been cramped in the car and her neck got twisted. I mean, doesn't that happen often to all of us? You're in the car, in the passenger seat, and all of a sudden your head just gets completely twisted because, you know, you're in a very small... What kind of car was he in? Bear in mind, he's known as Igor when he was growing up because he was really big. Not imagining that his story is washing well. Anyway, takes the police to the remote spot and he shows them empty bottles of spirits that Dawn had been drinking. And they are like, you are a lying maniac, clearly who has taken this poor woman, sexually assaulted her and tried to kill her and crush her child's skull. We are arresting you and you will never walk the streets again. No, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. They were like, oh, so basically she got really drunk and made this story up. And he's like, yeah, basically. So yes, they do charge him with sexual assault, but because of the fact that it's so minimal in comparison to the reality of the charge, he gets released. He even fails to turn up to court to actually be tried for it. Now, there is a warrant issued for his arrest, but ultimately the charge gets reduced to a misdemeanor and authorities decide it's not worth the cost of extradition. So they just drop all the charges. Let that sink in. I mean, at best in their mindsets, he was a sex offender. At worst, the truth that she's been telling and the fact that he nearly murdered her means that they have a murderer potentially on the loose. But they're just like, it's just not worth the money. And if you think about it, that's why he gets to kill other people. So we've had the first crime where other people have taken responsibility for it. He can't even get people to believe that they're not guilty, even though he's confessing everywhere. And now, He's got away with basically trying to kill somebody else. So he's really emboldened by this. He feels like he's basically able to go out and do it. He's kind of got a mindset anyway where he thinks that if victims come across him, they deserve to die. So he's now got this real psychological bolstering, this belief that he can just do it. And that's terrifying. And the superiority that he would feel as well. Remember, this is a man who had little meaning as a child and suddenly... He is above the authorities. He's outsmarting everyone. He's getting away, not just with murder, but with sexual assault. All of these things are making him feel that this is his job. This is why he's here. And that's terrifying. Jesperson 
ironically, had always wanted to join the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So in the back of his mind, there is something about wanting to be in control, isn't there? When you join the police, it's because you're going to have some power. And he actually gets accepted onto a programme and he was well on course to achieving his dream. However, unfortunately, he suffers a fall in the training exercise which puts an end to his ambition. In fact, he falls from another rope. He gets severely injured and that means that he's unable to complete his training and he's actually dismissed from the programme. And he would definitely be crushed because he wanted to be a Mountie, it's as simple as that. And it seems like this just added further fuel to his seething anger. Because remember, we know he's carrying this rageful intent anyway. We also know that periods of stress exacerbate negative behaviours and this is the perfect storm. He felt he'd been robbed of his dream and it's almost as if at that point he decided that all he wanted to do is to take out the frustrations that he felt, the anger that he felt. Because one, he's developed a taste for killing and now he wants to carry out more killings and he's not been apprehended. So this is a perfect storm waiting to happen. He gets relocated to Cheney, Washington, and at this point he gets returned to truck driving. And this time he's an interstate truck driver. And I think about that. If you are a serial killer, you are going to want to have access to people, but you're not going to want authorities to know who you are or what you're doing. And if you're traveling interstate, going from place to place, well, you can indulge those violent fantasies and essentially get away with it doing that job. He also was quick to realise that the best victims were those who wouldn't be missed. So his main attention was to target prostitutes and transients. One, they're much more vulnerable. Two, they've got poor support networks. Three, they're very accessible. And four, they will go with you if they feel that they're going to be given money or food or shelter. So it's the perfect opportunity for him to carry out these violent fantasies. So he's got this perfect opportunity to fulfill his twisted desires. Also, this guy is physically intimidating. He was six foot seven and he weighed 240 pounds. Jesperson strikes again on the 30th of August, 1992. There's been more than two years since his first known kill. The body of an unidentified woman is found near Blythe, California. She'd been dead for several weeks. They found from the post-mortem that she'd been raped and she'd been strangled. He would later claim that her name was Claudia, but the truth is she remains completely unidentified to this day. So somebody is missing a family member and they never realised that this had happened to her. It's as simple as that, which is awful. Those Jane Doe situations, they're just awful because you always hope that no matter who you are, if you disappear, someone is going to care. And what does it say when people disappear and no one does? It's deeply upsetting, isn't it? He didn't wait as long for his next kill though, because the next month the body of Cynthia Lynn Rose is found along the US Highway 99 in Turlock, California. Now according to Jesperson, she entered his truck at a truck stop when he was sleeping. She was a prostitute and Jesperson felt really angry with her because he'd previously said he wasn't interested in having sex with her. So to deal with this frustration, he strangled her to death. So that was his response and reaction and again, He's giving her responsibility. Well, if you hadn't come in to my truck when I told you I didn't want sex, then I would not have had to kill you. But you can kind of relate to what his thoughts and feelings are, that he's in a scenario where he believes ultimately that he is an individual who can inflict this pain and suffering on those that he reaps and believes deserve it. What he's saying is, as far as he is concerned, if you come into his territory, then you are asking to die. Remember, that's his psychology. He's already said it. As far as he's concerned, this is how the victims are meant to die, just like in a crash or an accident. It's the way it is. So he's okay with carrying out that behaviour. There's no conscience there at all. Now, at this point, he writes to the Oregonian and claims responsibility for Cynthia's murder, and he signs the letter off again with the customary smiling face. That anonymous letter is handed to the police, but it creates no new leads. He's still targeting prostitutes at this point, and the next victim was Laurie Ann Pentland of Salem, Oregon. Her body was discovered in November the same year behind a G.I. Joe's store. Now, Jesperson claims that the reason that he murdered her was that they had sex and then she tried to double her fee. This led to an argument. 
She threatened to call the police, and so he had snapped and strangled her. Remember, these people are pathological liars. The fact that he's saying that this is the way it played out is probably highly unlikely. He tries to present himself as a victim in these circumstances, albeit we can see he isn't, but it's highly unlikely that a prostitute would threaten to call the police because she wasn't getting the right amount of money that she wanted. I mean, the police are not going to do anything but arrest her and cart her ass off to prison, are they? So the reality that that's the actual way it played out is unlikely. He'd also later send another happy face letter to the media stating, I felt so much power, I then told her that she was going to die, and I slowly strangled her, just like the animals. She's really perfected this, hasn't he? Now, the fifth victim, again, would prove to be another unidentified female. Jesperson would claim that her name was either Carly or Cindy, but, again, she remained unidentified. Her body was discovered June 1993 in Santanella, California. Now, she'd only been dead a couple of days when they found her. She was listed by the police as a street person. And initially, they actually thought that she had taken a drug overdose, even though she'd been strangled to death. <laughs> Nevertheless, apparently on first review, they thought that it was an overdose. I think the fact that she was strangled to death is probably not indicative of a drugs overdose. Is it just me? Anyway, he dumped the body near the highway overpass. Isn't it interesting that he just has no consideration for even really hiding the bodies? It's just dumping them. So even though there is organisation to some degree in his crimes, he's also pretty forensically unsophisticated. Now, there's a year that passes before he strikes again. And this time it's in Crestview, Florida. That's in September 1994. Exactly the same pattern as before another unidentified woman and road workers find the body on interstate 10 and she was so decomposed that only her bones remained in fact the only feature they could establish was that she was female and that she was around 40 years of age now according to jesperson she was called suzanne she was from miami and he met her at a truck stop in tampa and she was on her way to reno he raped and strangled her to death in his truck and then he dumped her body along the highway near Pensacola. Same year, Oregonian newspaper receives another note from the alleged serial killer. And it said, in a lot of opinions, I should be killed and I feel I deserve it. My responsibility is mine and God will be my judge when I die. I'm telling you this because I will be responsible for these crimes and no one else. It all started when I wondered what it would be like to kill someone. And I found out. What a nightmare it has been. Now, we could spend two hours analysing that letter alone, couldn't we? The fact that he's saying it's a nightmare for himself, again, there's almost like a victim blaming, isn't there? It's their fault for making me kill them. But secondly, the fact that he's trying to suggest there is a conscience level, but he's not giving himself over to the authorities, so it's not real conscience. And the fact that he also talks about being judged in the next life, so he clearly doesn't think that he's gonna be brought to justice in this one. And also, just gonna throw it in there, Jesperson, I don't think your God is my God. I think your God is probably going to be somebody who turns up the heat on you for eternity, and I hope you burn well, my dear. Anyway, he claims as well in this letter that he's now killed six people and that he feels bad about the killings. Make what you will of that. Remember, these people are pathological liars. So apparently he's got this remorse, but he also says, I'm not stupid, I'm not gonna turn myself in. And he ends the letter with, look over your shoulder, I'm closer than you think. Sorry, is that your attempt at being remorseful, Mr. Jesperson? That after telling me that you have a conscience and it's really bad what you've done, you're suggesting that you might be behind me about to murder me. Hmm, you see, the problem with a psychopath, the problem with individuals with this mindset is they just can't help it, can they? The arrogance just shines through. So he could have made that a remorseful letter, but actually he makes it a threatening one. He just wants you to know that he's more powerful than you and that discredits what he's saying. Now in January 1995, he picks up 21 year old Angela Sabiz near Spokane in Washington. She would be his seventh victim. Now he agrees to take her to see her father in Colorado and she rides with him for about a week. 
So they're together for a week. Now on the way to see her father, she calls him and he basically says to stay away from him. So because of that, she changes her plans and she asks Jesperson to take her to Indiana instead. They stop at a truck stop in Wyoming and Jesperson wants sex, but Angela refuses. And he starts getting really angry because she keeps nagging him, in his words, to drive in bad weather so that she can get to Indiana and be with a boyfriend. So in response to that, in response to her request that he's basically agreed to, to take her to her boyfriend, he rapes and strangles her. And then he places his fist firmly on her throat and pressed until she was dead. And then he went back to sleep. Think about that. He fully extinguishes a human's life and then he just rolls over and goes back to sleep. In the morning, he drives to Nebraska. He binds her body with black nylon rope and he tied her to the underside of his truck. He drove with her dragging face down along the pavement for over 10 miles until her body came loose. And he said he did it to grind off her face and her prints. Now she had used his credit card for a phone call, so he wanted to conceal her identity. Now I have to be honest, when it comes down to post-mortem mutilation, that wasn't his MO. It wasn't something that he'd done in previous cases, but this was clearly an act of post-mortem mutilation to prevent them pinning the crime on him. He then takes a body and he dumps her in a ditch. Now during this period, Jesperson is living in Washougal, Washington. He's in a relationship with a long-term girlfriend, 41-year-old Julie Ann Winningham. She'd actually left her husband, who was also a truck driver, and she'd relocated to Utah. And that's where they met. They met at a truck stop in Utah, and he'd given her a lift back to Washington. And it seems like he did really like her, but she would end up being his final victim. The couple did get engaged, but at some point during their relationship, he starts to fixate on the idea that she's only after his money. And this feeds into his neurosis, into his insecurity. Remember, he's always felt that social relationships were problematic for him. He has a very low opinion of women per se, and he starts feeding this belief that she is basically using him, and that provokes a rage, an uncontrollable rage. So on the 10th of March, 1995, this woman that he's apparently in love with, he takes her, he gags her with duct tape, he rapes her in his truck, and he strangles her to death. And he dumps her naked body over an embankment. It only takes till the 11th of March when her body's found. It's found at this scenic outlook near Washougal, and it's just alongside State Highway 14. Now she is and was the only victim connected to him. It would also be her murder that would basically lead to him being apprehended. This was the absolute vital connection the authorities had been looking for. The police very quickly established that Julie had last been seen leaving Utah with Jesperson. So they speak to his employers and they also then establish his driving route and he's apprehended in New Mexico. So on the 22nd of March, he's arrested and questioned by police for six hours. Doesn't confess and actually refused to answer any questions. So it's a no comment situation. And we all know about those no comment situations, don't they? It immediately means the police think you are guilty. You're basically guilty. You may as well just tell us because now we all absolutely know you're guilty, but he refuses to answer these questions. And oh, this is really frustrating. He's released due to the lack of evidence. And then he travels to Arizona. At this point, the police are obviously clearly investigating him. They think that he is definitely guilty. And Jesperson does know it's a matter of time before he gets apprehended. And he then, trying to control the situation again, he tries to kill himself. And he actually tried to kill himself twice. He tries to overdose on sleeping pills, but he fails to succeed because his body essentially rejects them. He then writes a letter to his children and to his brother, Brad, saying that he's killed eight people over five years. Just the kind of letter you want off your dad, isn't it? Or your brother? Oh, I've got, it's, a, it's my brother's, brother's handwriting, my dad's handwriting. I'll just have a read of this. I hope he's gonna tell me about his journeys. Maybe there'll be some money in here. Oh, well, that wasn't what I was thinking. 
Apparently dad stroke sibling has killed eight people over five years. Again, what does that tell you about boundaries? Would you burden your children that way? Even your brother that way? In itself, it shows you there is a delusion to his understanding around the kind of relationships and appropriate relationships that you have with people in your life. And in that letter, he says, I am sorry that I turned out this way. I've been a killer for five years and I've killed eight people, assaulted more. I guess I haven't learned anything. Dad always was worried about me because of what I have gone through in the divorce, finances, etc. I've been taking it out on different people. As I saw it, I was hoping they'd catch me. I took 48 sleeping pills last night and I woke up well rested. The night before, I took two bottles of pills at no avail. They will arrest me today. Jesperson posted letters, then called the police and confessed to killing his fiancée, Julie. Now, this was not an act of remorse or to prevent him killing more. He basically hoped that if he gave himself up, it might result in leniency when it came to sentencing because he knew that there was a strong likelihood he would face the death penalty. So, gets arrested on the 30th of March, 1995, returns to Washington, calls his brother and says, Brad, Brad, about that letter. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, that letter. Yeah, the, the one where I confessed to killing eight people and assaulting more, yeah. Yeah, can you destroy it? I don't, well, I mean, it's just, it would be really helpful if you destroyed it because, you know, I've got like a pending case and I've kind of admitted, you know, what, hello? 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 Imagine it went something like that. It's my reenactment of that phone call. Brad, if you're watching this, let me know. On a serious note, he does try to get that letter destroyed. Now, whilst in custody, his attorney asks about the confession letter that he sent his brother. And in an adrenaline scared rush, he basically begins revealing everything. So that conversation leads to him confessing to the killing of Angela Sabiz in January. He'd also told other inmates who had actually reported him to the authorities, which always gets me, the fact that there are these criminals and then somebody confesses to these criminals and they're like, that is too far. I am speaking to the police about you. So they had actually gone ahead and had the conscience to do that, which is fantastic. But people hadn't even realised that Angela was missing because she had such a transient lifestyle. He's actually shown a photo of Angela and at that point he does confirm that it was the person that he killed and he tells them the specific details. He said that she had a cartoon Tweety Bird tattoo on her ankle, making an obscene gesture with its wing, and tells the police where they could find a body. And her remains were found along the Interstate Highway 80 in Nebraska. Her body was really badly decomposed. She'd been lying in tall grass for several months, so most of her skin had decayed, but the tattoo on her ankle was still visible. Authorities could only determine that she was a white woman in her 20s or 30s. Now, he later retracted this confession once he realised he could face the death penalty in Wyoming. So he basically realises that he's confessed in a state where he can be put to death. And he's like, yeah, you know that girl that I said I murdered with the tattoo, with that obscene gesture? Yeah, I actually left her safe and sound and literally she was fine when she went off. Oh really? Well then, how can we find a body where you told us? I mean, just throwing it out there. So you can see he's kind of thinking on his feet, but it's not an effective way. Now, later he tries another approach and he confesses to Angela's murder, but he claims it happened in Nebraska, not Wyoming. So ultimately, unbelievably, he avoids the death penalty in exchange for his guilty plea. That is something that I think is a challenging one for most of us because it's a way of manipulating the system to your benefit, so to speak, because arguably what he'd done certainly met the level we would expect for somebody to get the death sentence in the States. Handwriting experts were also brought in because obviously they've got Jesperson's letter to his brother and they've got all those letters that have been sent to journalists, which means that they can compare the two to see whether he was the happy face killer and the handwriting was very similar. Also, the description of the crimes were also similar. So the authorities realised at this point, look, we probably have the happy face serial killer, which must have been 
such a feeling of relief because serial killers are horrifically terrifying but of course if they're not apprehended the likelihood is they're going to carry on and their death count is going to get higher and higher and higher now jesperson during this period of time continues to contact media and he claimed responsibility for many more killings in fact he claimed that there were at least 160 people that he'd murdered and in one letter he wrote there was claudia a girl wanting to ride to phoenix arizona with me she tried to extort my wallet from me and died trying. Then there was Cynthia Limrose, a prostitute working the southbound rest area on Highway 99 near Turlock, California. Then Laurie Ann Pentland, a prostitute working the Burns Brothers truck stop in Winsonville, Oregon. Then a Jane Doe prostitute working the Petro truck stop in Corning, California. Then a woman I gave a ride to in Florida going to Lake Tahoe, Nevada. She called herself Suzanne. At one point, he's even questioned by detectives investigating the Green River killings because the murders were so similar. Now, obviously, we know who the Green River killer is. And if you haven't watched that video, I have covered it. So please feel free to go back and look at my back catalogue. It's there. Now, those things that he took responsibility for, those crimes he took responsibility for, he actually retracted most of what he said. So despite claims of killing 160 plus people, only eight of his victims have been confirmed to date. Following his arrest, many police departments reopened old cold cases because they felt that there were other possible victims of Jesperson. He also tried to confess to the 1992 murder of Bobby Crescenzi. Her husband, Jack Crescenzi, had already been convicted. Now it turned out He'd offered Jesperson $10,000 to take responsibility, which would be paid directly to his children on his release. Interesting that he was willing to take responsibility for that to give his children money. I imagine that there was some kind of bizarre belief that that was doing a good deed. And you're like, no, Jesperson, it's not actually a good deed to take $10,000, albeit to give your children, to allow a convicted murderer to walk free, thus making the streets a more dangerous place. But you know, let's not split hairs there, right? So like I said, he was obviously looking at ways to carry on being criminal even when he was inside. And another prisoner actually had acted as go-between to exchange the details. However, the police established that Jesperson had never even had contact with the victim. And that caused authorities to question his confession to Tonya's murder, remember the first one. Now, October 1995, he pleads guilty to Julie's murder in Clark County, Washington. Also, remember Laverne Pavlinak? Yeah, she's that one who gave a false confession to the police claiming that she and her abusive boyfriend, John Sosnowski, had murdered Jesperson's first victim, Tonya Bennett. They've been in prison this whole time for a murder they didn't commit. So whilst in custody for Julie's murder, Jesperson writes a letter to the Colombian newspaper and admits that he's the happy face killer. He admits to killing Tonya and he says, I will not be happy until I am replacing that man, Sosnowski, in the Oregon State Penitentiary from the crime I did. And he goes free. Now, at first, authorities didn't believe him, convinced that they have the right people in prison. However, he then told police where they could find Tonya's purse it wasn't with her body at the crime scene, remember, and also it had never been found because only the true killer would actually be able to provide such kind of detail. So he takes the police to where he dumped her body, accurately described the position of the body and other information that hadn't been released to the media. Pavlinak takes a lie detector test, maintains that she was not responsible for Tonya's death and had given a false confession. She passed. Jesperson agrees to take a polygraph test and indicates that he was telling the truth when he claimed he'd killed Tonya. It wasn't until November 1995, that's more than four years since their conviction, that Pavlinak and Sanofsky finally got released. Apparently Jesperson wept with joy when they were set free. I'm not sure how to analyze that because there's a bit of me that says, he was just really gleeful that he got to take responsibility for that first kill. He was satisfied with it, he enjoyed it, and he didn't want other people taking credit for that murder. But we could also argue maybe there was a shred of conscience with him 
and that knowing that two innocent people had gone to prison wasn't something that sat well with him. Like I said, I would probably go for the first, but nonetheless, we should always bring in the potential other side of this reaction. Now, ultimately, Jesperson received a life sentence in Oregon for Tonya's murder with a minimum 30 year term. Which does not sound enough. Now, the truth is, he lightly confessed to this crime to avoid or at least delay possible trials and death penalties for Angela's murder in Wyoming. So, Oregon hadn't actually carried out a death penalty since the 1960s. Following various plea deals in return for confessions and information, Jesperson eventually received life sentences for the murders of Laurie Ann Pentland, Julie Ann Winningham, and Angela Sabrice. He is currently serving a sentence of life without parole at the Oregon State Penitentiary. Should he, for any bizarre, obscure reason, get parole in the distant future, which we all hope never happens, Basically, prosecutors in Riverside County, California, have said that they will have an intention to try him for a 1992 murder. So essentially, if he gets out, they're going to get him banged to rights for another one. I will tell you, he has taken up painting in prison. He even sells his work online. And if this doesn't piss you off as much as it does me, he even puts a smiley face next to his signature. Is it just me who doesn't think this is okay? Is it just me who feels that every time he puts a smiley face on a bloody picture, he's automatically letting you know that he doesn't have remorse for his crimes. He's using it as his branding. Just think about that. This is a serial killer who's murdered defenseless women and he's signing it with his very signature that he used having carried out the murders. I'm horrified at that. I'm sure it's nice for him to do art. I'm sure he's a diligent little painter. Whatever he needs to do, whatever gives him some activity. I don't think that people deserve to be treated like pigs. I don't think pigs deserve to be treated like pigs. So I do appreciate that when you're in prison, you need to be given activities and opportunities and creativity is a great way to deal with things like stress. Do I think you should be allowed to sell them? No, I think you should probably go, that's really nice. We're just gonna go off and burn them now. But you know, here's some more that you can paint and then we'll burn them as well. But the idea that money is being made from these, and I appreciate that won't go to him, but nonetheless, it's money being made from other people's absolute pain and it's signed with a serial killer's motif, so to speak. So when we look at Jesperson, we've got to acknowledge that he falls as a serial killer into the organised, disorganised category. He's organised in the way that he kills people who are unconnected to him as victims. He would also dump the bodies at random locations whilst driving his truck. He would often use aliases. So they're all very organized traits, but he was very disorganized when you think about the way he killed his fiance. Firstly, he would be an obvious suspect. Also, he killed his first victim, Tanya, at his home, that's disorganized and he dumped other victims at the side of the road. That's disorganized, it's very easy to be discovered. You don't get a lot of time between you and the killing. So those would be the disorganized traits. I think we can also acknowledge he's a lust killer potentially. Like I said, he was able to hold down relationships and he definitely could have sexual intercourse without a problem, but certainly it seems that the killings were sexually motivated. They involved sex and then killing. Also, he followed a typical pattern when you think about how you go from animal abuse to graduating to violent offences against people. So that fits in very neatly with serial killers' MOs. Now in Jesperson's own words, he said, no longer did I search for animals to mistreat. I now looked for people to kill. And I did. I killed over and over until I was caught. Now I'm paying for it with the rest of my life behind bars. We should stop the cruelty to anything before it develops into a bigger problem like me. <laughs> Sorry. Quite the little philosopher now, aren't you, Mr. Jesperson? Your creative artist be going on there. Maybe you could have thought about crafting and painting before you went out serial killing, just maybe. But this idea that now he's some kind of ethereal being telling people that, you know, he should have been stopped from doing the cruelty early on because look at how it's graduated. It's like, you are a heinous serial killer. You enjoyed your work. 
and you would have carried on getting away with it if you hadn't killed your fiance because of your own ego where you believed you were being used because you were after all such a catch i mean you're the perfect kind of guy that we'd all like to date aren't you by the way that is absolute sincere sarcasm a bit like your dad probably used to be with you and i am doing it because i feel malicious towards you to some degree so when you think about the sincerity of those words very doubtful given his actions and opinions and when you think about serial killers mo's i mean he's got a perfect one hasn't he always uses strangulation also usually raped his victims too victims tended to be unconnected to him aside from his last victim julie he used his job as a truck driver to kill in different states. He killed in Nebraska, California, Florida, Washington, Oregon, Wyoming, and his signature. Remember, that's different to the MO. The signature is something that's done for the emotional and psychological satisfaction of the killer. The MO does have a potential to transition and change. You know, people graduate, they perfect them, but the signature tends to be about the emotional and psychological requirement for the killer. So he targets women, you went for sex workers and transients. Three of his victims actually remain unidentified to this day. He sent letters to the authorities and to the media outlets claiming responsibility, and he signed his letters off with a happy face. That's his signature. The narcissism that he displayed, again, we expect to see high levels of narcissism in these serial killers. Really annoyed because the wrong people got the attention for Tonya's murder. He couldn't bear it wrote to the police and the media, also took delight in mocking them. In one of his letters, his twisted attempts at humour was horrific. He offered a serial killer starter kit. So in one of his letters, he literally suggests that he can help them look at creating a serial killer starter kit. And this is what he said. This is the offer you all have been dying for. The self-start serial killer kit. Now, you can be the only serial killer on your block. Learn from a professional serial killer. Get rid of that unwanted family member. Get that job you always wanted by opening up the slot. Everyone will be dying to meet you. You get a full life Julie Winningham lookalike doll with an extra tough spring back neck. So you will soon have the strength to squeeze the shit out of anyone. I mean, he sounds deeply remorseful. I think we can all acknowledge the level of consciousness and empathy is clearly there in that note. His opinion of women was horrific. In particular, his opinion towards sex workers. He made it clear during the police interrogation. He said that he felt they had it coming to them. He described them as piles of garbage that he dumped on the roadside. And as far as he was concerned, he felt he was putting them out of their misery. Again, the psychological displacement of the reality of his actions, what he's doing there, he's minimizing the killing by saying to some degree, they deserved it, but also, hey, their lives were so bad that I kind of ended it for them, meaning that they didn't have to deal with the suffering anymore. So misguided, so completely inappropriate and wrong, but very much the psychology of somebody who wants to justify their actions. Now, Jesperson still tried to maintain sense of control whilst he was in custody. He even wrote a letter to the Colombian newspaper, which he had smuggled out of prison. And in this, he expresses alleged remorse for his crimes. He says, I know what I've done has been wrong and I feel sorry for all of the families of my victims. I am, in fact, the happy face killer. I created that man because I wanted to be stopped. But it's just hard to come out and say it. I've prayed many nights in this cold, dark prison cell for the answer, and God has told me to come clear with it all. Tell me the truth about everything. Most people will say that I'm a monster. I am not a monster. Just like the movie Jurassic Park, I was created by people. I mean, I don't want to pull that a bit, but and one Jurassic Park is actually a film. It's not real it's not a documentary <laughs> they didn't actually grow the dinosaurs from amber mosquitoes they didn't do that but okay you obviously took it quite literally but the other thing is that when you think about jurassic park people didn't create the dinosaurs actually at all 
because the dinosaurs had existed. They brought them back to life, is what he means. Something that he didn't do with his victims, but nonetheless. So it's about as far away from Jurassic Park as possible. I suppose what he's saying is, you know, these monsters were created, these dinosaurs were created, and then they ate people. Therefore, it was the people who deserved that to take place, which is, again, skewed logic at best and stupidity at worst. However, I will give him the fact that he was created by people, as well as potentially by injuries, as well as potentially DNA and genetics, we can acknowledge that he does have a truth to that. And again, whilst we cannot forgive the man who is an adult, what we can say is no child should have been put through that endured experience of abuse and hostility and rejection in their childhood. He did not deserve that. Serial killer or otherwise, he did not deserve that. And these are contributing factors. And if you take away some of those contributing factors, you get a different outcome. So without that childhood, would he have been a serial killer? I don't know. The jury's out on that one. He may have still been. But the point is, without a doubt, he did not deserve that experience in childhood. I think we can honestly say that the reason that he's writing those letters is he wants to play the system, he wants to sway public opinion, he must have to some degree because some fools buy his art. And I'm sorry, I say that with real truth. I don't care how good they are. I don't care if it's better than a Dali. I don't care if he makes Monet look like a fool, like Picasso doesn't understand anything about perspective in the way that he did. I hope that, you know, his art could be better than Van Gogh, although sometimes I do think that my art could be better than Van Gogh. I'm joking, I do like Van Gogh. Just saying that, you know, there are some pictures that are painted and they literally look like the person. And then there's some that don't. And Van Gogh's more that, but I do love him. And I have seen his collection. And I'm sure he's a very nice guy. But the point is that nobody should buy this kind of stuff because it comes from a place of depravity and harm. And it shouldn't be encouraged as far as I'm concerned. It's my personal opinion of judgment. I know I'm very judgy on that. I cannot help it. I hope that you will agree that it's a bit weird when people buy serial killer art. Also, I guess the one thing we can all be incredibly thankful for is he will die in prison. In 2008, Jesperson actually wrote to his daughter, Melissa, and he said, I don't want the world to judge me as a dad. I was a great dad. My only mistake was my eight errors in judgment. I mean, obviously that's how it works. You're a serial killer. You've ruined your family's lives to some degree. You've got consequences of his children having to live with the horror that they're related to that. And yet he doesn't see any of those actions as anything but small misdemeanors that, you know, if you get rid of them, I was a fantastic father. No, you weren't. You used to discuss sex with your daughter, talk highly inappropriately, as well as murdering people who were completely innocent. I mean, that's just for starters. Also, to be fair, the minute that you hung those kittens, you'd lost me as a fan. So the reality is that he just has a skewed perspective about who he's been in his life in general. It's incredible how he minimizes those eight brutal murders as errors in judgment. Errors in judgment. Painting one of my rooms orange was an error in judgment once. That was an error in judgment. Quite a few hairstyles I've had. Errors in judgment, without a doubt. There have been errors in judgment about what I selected from menus when somebody else got a bigger portion and went for something different. That's an error in judgment. An error in judgment is not eight brutal murders. That's a serial killing history. In 2014, Melissa actually told the media, my father will never get the death penalty for the crimes, but he should. I don't say that for myself, but for his victims. Justice will never be served to them. I'm not gonna go into the details of the horrific torture he inflicted on those poor women who were mothers and daughters and sisters. Not all his victims have even been identified. There are some parents who still don't know where their daughter or sister disappeared to. And I'm ending it with that particular quote for one reason and one reason alone, because often we talk about genetics and DNA and the reality of how you're formed. But the evidence of Melissa and undoubtedly her siblings is that they not only know right from wrong, that they're able to take that wrong 
and to judge their own parent incredibly harshly and rightfully harshly. The fact that they are obviously empathic, they understand warmth, they understand pain and grief. So in spite of his awful lineage, so to speak, it seems that he's created children who have empathy, tolerance, compassion and understanding. And it's important to acknowledge. So often people are judged harshly because of things that happened outside of their control. In this case, a father who was a serial killing maniac. I hope you found this interesting. I hope that I've given you some added value to the information that's out there on this particular serial killer. I know it's been a long one, but you do like long ones. You do say you like long ones, so I'm not gonna apologize, actually. I'm gonna take, I'm glad I've done a long one. I hope you've enjoyed it to some degree. And also, just to think, kids, don't buy his art. It's weird. Really, 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 really weird. Just giving you some life advice there. If you have enjoyed this, please subscribe. If you don't subscribe already, get your notifications on because I'll release content every Wednesday and Sunday. Let me know what you've thought about it. Give me a like, give me a comment. I read them all. Thanks for that, Poppy, just at the end, doing a bit of a head flick. Don't know whether you heard that, but if you did, it wasn't something flapping in the wind. It was my dog. I'll see you again soon, my lovelies. Take care and thanks for coming to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny.